and Bill, we can hear you if you're talking. So let me see. Okay, there I am. There you are. Okay, well, it's certainly we'll go back here. I got this thing's a mess. Certainly nice to see some familiar faces and familiar names. And I suppose this program will explain where I've been for the last 10 years, as Barry has kind of hinted at. And uh, my keen interest in photography has really been what's kept me away from the club, despite all the activity that I had that Barry explained. Uh, but it's certainly nice to see all of you and uh, see names and faces that are very familiar to me. So we're going to see tonight birds at home and afar, and I've limited it to six years of travel for birding and photography. Um, my first international trip for birding was to Costa Rica with Wildside Nature Tours in 2012. And that was followed in 2014 by a trip to um, trip to I'm messing up here. Trip to Puerto Rico with Wildside Nature Tours and Gabriel Lugo, and to Morocco with Adrian Bins and Wildside Nature Tours. And then in 2015 to Honduras for a photo workshop, my first photo workshop with Kevin Laughlin. And so my first, the first uh, international trip that we will talk about when I get to it will be one that I did to India. Just to get the photography kind of out of the way that will be mentioned in other, other parts of the talk. My interest in photography actually started with uh, John McNamara and uh, his interest in photography and digiscoping during club trips. And then when John moved eventually to digital cameras, DSLRs, I eventually moved and worked my way up to a complete Canon Pro set. For those of you who know camera equipment will recognize that equipment. But in the beginning of 2020, I switched to a complete Olympus Pro set I shoot in RAW, as most avid photographers, bird photographers do. And I do a lot of processing, we'll mention some of that, in both Lightroom and Photoshop. We're going to start at home, and home uh, for me is in Berks County, up on top of Irish Mountain, deep in oak-dominated woods. And every year, I have a nesting pair of Phoebes visiting, and they do a great job of perching and cooperating for photography. A pair of palliated woodpeckers nearby, and this was not cropped. I had a uh, fixed lens and the bird was literally that close. Lots of thrushes, including this viri. And I have a massive array of feeders I actually have, including the ground. 12 feeding locations set up during the winter. And obviously red-bellied woodpeckers are frequent visitors to the suet and other feeding stations that I have. I found and photographed a house wren during the winter. I never saw it at a feeder, but it was nearby. Obviously not a winter photograph, but I did have large flocks of American robins at my heated bird bath all winter long. I don't normally keep photos that show birds at um, feeding stations, but I really like this photo of a Carolina wren and his, his obvious attitude, so I've kept that one. I did have purple finches through most of the winter. This is a female. I did have, I think on a couple of occasions, a male. And of course, everybody likes photographs of northern cardinals in the snow. And we had up to 27 inches of snow at, on, uh, in Berks County this past uh, winter. I had probably two or three dozen at one time um, morning doves feeding on the ground and hairy woodpeckers. 
lots of juncos, lots of white-throated sparrows. They're all gone now. And my resident white-breasted nuthatch. And of course, the winter plumage European starling. The first international trip we'll look at was India in 2015. I remember during my club years, I spent six months working in India, did a little bit of birding, but not much, and always wanted to go back um, as a tourist or as our old friend from the bird club, Jim Plyler, used to say, using birds as a vehicle to see the world. So I went back in 2015 for a three week trip with Wildside Nature Tours and Adrian Bins. And uh, I did take the photo in the title shot here, but the answer to your question is no. When we go on these trips, these international trips, we don't miss the opportunities to visit historic sites, sites that, and other things that you would like to see as a tourist if you were not birding and not there for bird photography. And so we don't miss those opportunities, although we do bird at these sites. And we did spend time at the magnificent Taj Mahal and no picture does that site justice. You really have to be there. And those towers look like they're leaning out, are in fact leaning out as protection of the Taj Mahal in case of an earthquake. Lots of Hindu temples in India. And this one was kind of uh, unique in that it was on top of a hillside and there was a long queue of people waiting in line, uh, waiting in a queue to go up to uh, whatever the God was in that temple. We were doing birding along the river there. We visited lots of historic sites, with very exotic locations, temples and palaces. And yes, we did have an elephant ride. And there were other touristy things like uh, snake charmers still around in India. But the real India, as any Indian will tell you, is in the country. And this is an example from the country of hand padded cow patties, cow manure patties that are put out to dry to be used as fuel for fires and for heating and for construction of homes. Onto the birds, the black kites on the left. I think I photographed that actually at the Taj Mahal. We had lots of black kites on the trip. In fact, when we were on our way back to New Delhi and we're driving on a major highway past the huge open dump for the garbage of the city, uh, there were literally hundreds of thousands of black kites uh, soaring over the dump or on the dump. The uh, changeable, um, changeable hawk eagle on the right, we saw that in numerous plumages. We had 19 species of, of uh, hawks or eagles on the trip. Pair of pied kingfishers. We had four species of those on the trip. Uh, four species of kingfishers. The Indian robin. The Indian roller, named for the twisting and turning displays that the male makes pretty much in breeding uh, season. Uh, and it favors wires. And so we had the bird perched on the wire and it dropped down as it will do to pick up a beetle off the ground. And I was lucky enough to get this shot of the bird and how it swallowed the beetle by tossing it in the air and catching it deeper in its throat. And our guide, although I've forgotten the name, our guide was able to identify the beetle. The Asian barred owlet, about the same size as the Eastern screech owl. And it was up against a very dark background though I did a little processing on this photo. There's always target species for any photographic trip or any birding trip, particularly international ones. And certainly if you're in Northern India and visiting places like Ranthambore uh, National Park, Ranthambore Tiger Park, uh, tigers are the target species and the guides and leaders don't rest until you get to see a tiger. These are pug marks of a very large male tiger, as you can tell by a comparison to the all wheel drive vehicle tracks. We did get to see three tigers and this was one that walked out of the brush and walked within six to eight feet of our open top safari vehicle. And the only fear you had at that moment was, would I get a clear shot of the tiger? 
This is a green billed Malcoa. It's in the cuckoo family. It's quite a large bird, 19 to 23 inches long, and a little difficult to photograph because it tends to, much like other cuckoos, tends to slink through the underbrush. Holy neck stork. Uh, we had five stork species on this trip to India. A bio weaver on the left. Uh, it's a colony nester and named for the long pendulous nests that this species makes, that the weaver genus makes. And to the right, the green bee eater. They're also colony nesters nesting in um, holes in riverbanks. And they are aerial hunters. Some of the species of the bee eaters can spot an insect, a flying insect, uh, food or prey. Uh, 200 feet away. They do catch bees and wasps, and I've watched them remove the venom sacs and stingers by rubbing their prey against a wire fence like this or a, a branch. Rose ring parakeet on the left and slaty headed parakeet, parakeet on the right. We had uh, five species of parakeet on this trip. And we had five species of drongos. This is the black drongo. And it's kind of oddly cropped. Back in those days, I really didn't have my act together on cropping pictures. And uh, so I did a lot of square cropping, as odd as that looks. Purple sunbirds. Sunbirds are kind of the hummingbirds of Africa, Middle East, China, Australia. Uh, they're pollinators, much like the hummingbirds we are familiar with. And there's 145 species of sunbird within the areas that I've just described. We do a lot of river um, birding on these trips. And uh, we were in a boat and we had an opportunity to see some crocodiles. This is a mugger or marsh crocodile. And I'll photograph anything that poses for me. And we had uh, three primate species on this trip. And this is a Northern Plains gray langur, uh, a nice profile. My second photography trip, my first was the trip to Honduras with Kevin Laughlin. My second photography workshop was a week long trip in Florida in 2016 with Jared Lloyd photography. And my title shot here is obviously Sandhill Cranes with young, it's known as a colt. And for you photographers, this was taken in white balance, Kelvin 10,000 to emphasize the yellow light of the sunrise. Wood stork, sandwich turns, and uh, as you do in bird photography, as much as possible, you try to get down at eye level for the bird. So we're all lying prone in the sand taking shots of these displaying, uh, it was breeding season, taking shots of these displaying sa uh, sandwich turns. There is a very famous rookery around Sarasota, Florida, and a small island in a public park that is attractive to birders and particularly photographers. And I snapped a shot of uh, Grady Egret and two juveniles and the black crowned night heron. But Sarasota, Florida is also a good place to find burrowing owls. And quite frequently, they have their eyes partially closed. So a goal of photographers is to get a shot with the eyes wide open. And I noticed that the birds, while preening, and when they would stop preening, they would jerk their heads up and their eyes would be wide open, obviously assuring themselves that there were no predators nearby. So I timed my shot to get the eyes fully open. Black neck stilt and a stalking tricolored heron. Osprey with lunch. And two of my favorite shots from the trip barred owl and a juvenile great horned owl. And both these shots were heavily processed from daylight shots into night shots. My next uh, trip was also a uh, photography trip 
to Ecuador in 2017 with Naturescapes uh, led by Greg Downing, the owner of that company. And uh, one of your target uh, families in Ecuador and Central America and anywhere in South America are the tanagers. They are the real color and the real beautiful birds in, uh, in the Americas. And um, this is the golden tanager. If you had this app and you were quick on the draw, you recorded your position as we crossed the equator. You can see from the uh, uh, position there. One of the joys of international travel is sampling indigenous foods. Uh, I could subscribe to a couple of travel magazines and half the articles are about food. And if you are in places like Ecuador or Peru, you could sample guinea pig, which is what this is. Back to birds. Um, this is the blue gray tanager. I've seen this on a lot of my trips in Central America and South America, very common bird. But one of the target of, of families of birds that you're after are the hummingbirds when you're in Central or South America, literally hundreds of species. This is the racket-tailed pufflegs, and the pufflegs can be found in two genera with about 15 species of pufflegs in those genera. This is the male puffleg racket tail, and here are the male and female puffleg racket tails. You don't find very many hummingbird species in rainforests, and a lot of us think about rainforests when we think about Ecuador and um, Costa Rica. You have to go to altitude to find large numbers of, of uh, hummingbirds. You have to go into the cloud forest from 3,000 to 10,000 feet in elevation. And the cloud forests look exactly like uh, what I showed you, what I'm showing you here. Very cloudy, lots of rain, lots of vegetation, different vegetation from the rainforest, but uh, lots of species and lots of hummingbirds. I'm having trouble here. There we go. Including shots like this of a um, green crowned brook. Uh, what's going on here? There we go. Sorry about that. That's where I do my framing. Um, green crowned brilliant and buff tailed coronet. Of uh, the genuses of the hummingbirds are their last name, the brilliants the coronets, the mangoes, and so forth. Uh, the coronet genus hummingbirds family has three species and the brilliants have seven species. How do we get shots like this of uh, posed hummingbirds with wings and stop action and flowers and a nice uh, bouquet or flat background? We use uh, the professional set us up with multi-flash setups as they're called. So you see the background set up there, which is just a photograph on paper hanging from a tripod of uh, four flashes, one lighting the background and three lighting the bird and flower. The birds are attracted to the piece of the uh, normal hummingbird feeder that you see, the red plastic, looks up and sees the flowers, goes up to the flowers, and you using usually a cable release I hit the cable release and the, uh, uh, all the flashes go off at the same time and you get stop action because of the amount of light that you're using. And you get shots like this, the racket tail puff leg on the left, one of my favorite photographs and the buff tail coronet on the right. When we are not photographing uh, with the when it's not our turn to photograph with the uh, setups, we're out photographing in the cloud forest other birds that are perched and available. Obviously, we have to use some fill flash to do this because it's quite dark in those, uh, in those habitats, particularly when it's raining, which is most of the time. So uh, this is a velvet purple coronet. And this is a chestnut-breasted coronet. You can see the raindrop indicating again that 
we had lots of rain. I think we were in rain gear most of the time and had our cameras protected on most of this trip, at least in the cloud forest. This is a, another buff-tailed coronet, but in a pose that's kind of sought after by hummingbird photographers, a crucifix pose. And the coronets are very aggressive birds. They tend to chase other birds away from feeders and make life a little difficult, both for birders uh, and for uh, photographers, but that's just part of, part of nature. Another beautiful tanager, the blue-winged mountain tanager, my, probably my favorite tanager that I've photographed. Red-headed barbet, uh, new world uh, species closely related to toucans. Crimson runt, crim crimson runt toucanet. Slate-throated redstart, the new world warbler in the new world warbler family found in Mexico, Central America, and Southwestern United States, probably being in uh, Chester County this summer or this spring. If you are in these places in Central and South America, in migration season, usually I'm there in April, you will see birds in migration, such as the Swainson thrush. And the last photograph from Ecuador, two buff-tailed coronets that have to be a married couple. Um, I'll show you this picture. This was at one site in Ecuador, our little group photographing. And the reason I have this picture here is to point out that this is on private property. And many people in Ecuador and uh, other places throughout Central and South America have uh, learned that they can earn money, preserve habitat, preserve species by setting up stations like this charging some money to come in, setting up feeders, feeding locations, perches for birds, uh, restrooms, always needed, and uh, earn money and preserve habitat. And you do see frequently on my trip signs like this, welcome bird watching here. Cuba in 2018. I went to Cuba with Wild Side Nature Tours. This was a birding trip with Gabriel Lugo the person I went to Puerto Rico with and the top birder in Puerto Rico. And yes, uh, the uh, 1950s cars are in uh, uh, great supply in Cuba and they earn lots of money with them. These are all taxi cabs and we had a tour around Old Havana with klaxons blowing in these beautiful old convertibles, large steering wheels because they, uh, um, uh, they didn't have power steering. And they've all been converted to diesel uh, because they obviously their original motors uh, wore out. Um, going in 2019 in the Trump years uh, was not as easy as during the Obama years when things were relaxed, requirements were relaxed. So you had to go with at least two, one of five different, uh, one or two of five different categories in mind. You couldn't just go as a plain tourist. You had to go and we went as a, uh, as an educational trip and as what they call person to person and that we were expected to relate to uh, people we met, learn about Cuba, uh, talk to them about democracy. And I did that, it was quite enjoyable. One of the other requirements was that you had to use Cuban guides. And these were our Cuban guides, a mother and daughter team, uh, wonderful birders, wonderful people. Uh, the daughter uh, was a student at the university in Havana. Her education was being paid for by the government and to pay them back, she would owe them two years of service. When she completed her education, she was studying German and expected to be a translator in an embassy for two years. The other requirement that we had was you had to stay in um, guest houses. And many of those were being built all over Cuba. And we saw them being built, it was big business. And uh, you had to stay out of the hotels unless there were no guest houses available in the area you were, you were birding in or photographing in. We did stay in, in guest houses in Old Havana. This is a view from my window or the balcony in, in the guest, uh, guest house I stayed in, a uh, magnificent part of the old city. We also visited La Finca, Hemingway's estate lovingly maintained by the Cubans. You cannot enter uh, the estate uh, you can go to the estate, but you cannot enter the house. 
uh, people started stealing items from the house. And so they have the doorways roped off and you're pretty much relegated to having pictures uh, taken from the doorways and windows. Although I paid one of the, uh, one of the uh, security people to take pictures in every room in the house. So I have pictures from every room in the house. You may have thought Fidel Castro passed away some time ago. Those rumors are untrue. I expected a large military presence in, in Cuba. I didn't see it. I see far more military presence in countries like Morocco and India. But I did see a lot of anti-American billboards like this one smashing Uncle Sam with blockade below. On to birds. This is the Cuban toady endemic to Cuba. Very small bird, 4.3 inches in length. Uh, five toadies are endemic to the islands, to islands in the Caribbean. Great lizard cuckoo, very large bird, 17 to 22 inches. And this is the Cuban race of that species. Again, if you're there in migration, you pick up things like American red star. Cuban grass quit endemic to Cuba. It's in the Tanager family and the grass quits can be found in uh, uh, Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. West Indian woodpecker, Cuban pygmy owl, a very small owl, smaller than Eastern screech owl, about six and a half inches. And this, I just got curious about the distribution of an endemic bird. And I looked this up on eBird and made this slide. And it shows a pretty wide distribution of sightings of the Cuban pygmy owl throughout Cuba. Uh, not a great photo. This was taken almost straight up. Stygian owl, one of the first birds we had on the Cuban trip. But a target bird for the trip and an easy one to get because we went to a gentleman's house where he has constant uh, feeding of bee hummingbirds. They are endemic to Cuba and they are the smallest living bird in the world. 6.1 centimeters, two and seven sixteenth inches. Keep in mind that the ruby-throated hummingbird is huge by comparison at three and three quarter inches. We actually went there twice. Nobody regretted being seeing these birds twice in the trip. Just to give you an idea, I took this photo off the web of how small this bird actually is. The one time we stayed in a hotel was out on the Cuban Keys or Keys. And uh, this was a mangrove cuckoo, which if you're in South Florida, you can find that bird there as well as in Cuba. Another Cuban endemic, the Cuban peewee. Greater Antillean grackle, fairly large bird, 11 inches. And a bird that we actually see here in the east now, at least I see it on eBird, white-winged dove, a very common bird through Central and South America. The Cuban trogon, an endemic, and trogons are found all over the world in tropical forests. And the red-legged thrush, Cuban race of that species. My next trip was also for photography, and this was back with Naturescapes and Greg Downing in 2019 to Costa Rica. And Puerto Vida is, is the uh, common phrase, common greeting or salutation in Cuba, you know, translated literally pure life, but used as a greeting or to say goodbye to somebody. It means, you know, celebrate life. Uh, don't take life too seriously. It's a really laid back country. I really like it in Costa Rica. I've been there about four times now and have lots of Costa Rican friends. The guides were great. The local guides were great at going out into the forest and finding us things to photograph. We want to do some macro photography, including this cute little red eyed tree frog. Um, the males are only two inches long, very tiny frog, but a nice for a setup and uh, for some macro photography. One of my favorite photographs is Keel Build, Keel Build Toucan. Um, and I like this photograph because the background is not the traditional bird photograph, bouquet or flat 
undistinguished background. It shows some of the habitat and it shows you can have that habitat in a photograph and still have the bird pop off the photograph. Now, this bird is quite amazing and to watch. It moves its head in extremely slow motion. So it gives you lots of opportunities for photographs in many positions. Red-legged honeycreeper. And I was fortunate enough to photograph this bird in flight to see its beautiful wing pattern. Another gorgeous tanager, the silver-throated tanager. And the Passerini's tanager, I actually had this in my first trip to Costa Rica, which was not for birding or for photography, although I, I uh, did some birding. I was just down there visiting Costa Rican friends, the Passerini's tanager. And this photo was not saturated in any way, post-processing, that is the red of the rump of the bird. And uh, the goal with any photography of this bird is to capture that red as it really is. In the rainforest, we didn't do any uh, hummingbird setups for what I've already said, they're found in the cloud forest. Uh, but in the rainforest, we did do setups for bats. And these are nocturnal, obviously nocturnal, but uh, 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 nectar eating bats. And they discovered that they were in this area near our lodge and they set up a bat photographing setup, very similar to the hummingbird setup. But in this case, the bat triggers the flashes by breaking the infrared motion sensor. You merely stand there, you've set up your camera on manual flash, I'm uh, sorry, on manual focus at the proper distance. And you have set your camera to take a photo every second or half second. Yes, you do get a lot of black photos with nothing in them, but you also get some really great photos like this of a palace's long tongue, long tongue bat. The target species for Costa Rica and other areas in South America for um, any bird guide on a birding trip or certainly on for photographers is the prince of the cloud forest, the resplendent, resplendent quetzal. And this is another good example, in this case, a farmer preserving land, setting up a covered photography and bird watching area on a hillside overlooking uh, branches that he knew this bird came to. So he's preserving habitat, earning some money and uh, not clearing his land for farming in this area. Uh, and it offers great opportunities to see this bird and photograph it. We did do some hummingbird setups. And this is a uh, uh, juvenile green crowned brilliant. And sometimes you pick up other species at these setups. So uh, we have a um, female coppery headed emerald and a bananaquit. And the bananaquit's down there in the lower right. A very common bird, so common that on birding trips, when you're looking at, bro, oh, that's just another bananaquit. That's just another bananaquit. Uh, when you see a bird quickly. This is a female green crowned brilliant, a violet saber wing, one of my favorite birds, one of the first hummingbirds I had on my first trip to Costa Rica. White tailed emerald. And then we did some photography work where we didn't use flash. We did have a hummingbird feeder a set up again on private land. Um, and uh, the idea was when the bird backed off or stopped before it went to the feeder, you snap the photos. And so I was able to get this shot of, uh, of a uh, female green-breasted mango and a shot of the male green-breasted mango. Another shot in, uh, that, I, that I was able to take was an uh, olive back euphonia. Uh, these birds are in the finch family and their name euphonia is for their sweet voice. And here's one that's perched. Golden crowned chlorophonia in the, uh, it's a genus in the finch family. 
and it's endemic to the neotropics. Uh, it rained the entire time we were after this bird, uh, but uh, you're encouraged to go out. You, know, you put your rain gear on, cover your cameras, and uh, you don't miss an opportunity to get uh, to get bird photographs or you're on a birdie trip to see birds, much as John Mercer mentioned regarding one of the recent field trips. Not all of the tanagers are as colorful as the ones I've showed you, but uh, this is a striking bird, the common bush tanager. This is a pheasant-like great curassow, the male, a very large bird, 31 to 39 inches. And it's in the family with the guans and chocolacas, and it's, uh, and it's endemic to the neotropic rainforest. Perched nicely for us. We spent some time in a blind. The blind was the most well-constructed blind I've ever seen. I think it could have been a bomb shelter. The chairs in it would have made any CEO in any office very happy. The most comfortable chairs in any blind, I'm sure, anywhere in the world. They put out literally a pig's head. And when the guides found that the king vultures had found them, had found them, they called us and in groups we went up to photograph king vultures. Here's one in profile. Montezuma, Montezuma oropendula, uh, three species of oropendula. Um, I've seen at least two. They are a colony nester, nesting in long pendulous nests, as their name suggests. Uh, they have a small hole in the upper portion, the thin portion of that pendulous nest. And somehow this very large bird gets in there. I've seen them do it. And the colony nests are usually in an isolated tree away from other trees. And you see many of these nests hanging together. The guides are not the only persons to spot birds on these trips. Our driver spotted the laughing falcon on the left. And a number of us got out of the van to, to photograph it. And the uh, chestnut Collared, wood, colored woodpecker, a female on the right was at one of our rainforest locations. Another tanager, the flame colored tanager. And one of my favorite photographs, uh, two preening brown hooded parrots. And the last one from Costa Rica, the clay colored thrush, or sometimes including my field guide is referred to as the clay colored robin, the national bird of Costa Rica. And you might say, well, with all those beautiful tanagers, why would they have this as a national bird? Well, here's a shot from my field guide, and it shows you why. Huge and enormous distribution over most of the country. I think the white areas are just areas of extreme high elevation, well above the 2,400 meters uh, that's mentioned in the guide. But you can see even the guide says CR is nondescript national bird. And I first saw that on my first trip uh, to Costa Rica back in 2011. Last year, uh, right before the pandemic, I was in Peru for two back-to-back -back trips with Wild Side Nature Tours. And uh, I did get this uh, wonderful shot of Machu Picchu. That was the second part of the trip, birding Machu Picchu, as it was called. And about 10 minutes after I took this shot, the entire mountain was totally fogged in. And I don't think we would have had any opportunity uh, to get some of the traditional shots that we got of like this of, of Machu Picchu, a truly magnificent, a magnificent place. Uh, and you might say, well, gee, you guys got there early. There are no people there. That is not true. Uh, Photoshop took care of them. The first part of our trip was with Kevin Laughlin and two other, um, on a photography trip, two other uh, photography workshop, two other pros were with us, Lee Hoy and Rob Knight. And the trip was in Amazonia on this large boat for the entire week. And the large boat, well, we were on the Amazon briefly, we were mostly on uh, one of the major rivers feeding the Amazon and a very comfortable boat, very nice crew. We stopped first on our way to the boat in this small town to pick up school supplies and some sporting goods to give to kids and villages that we would visit 
during the trip. In that village, in that town, I noticed murals on the walls and I asked our guide about this one. And this was the coming of the missionaries to Peru. And the indigenous Peruvians thought these were phantasmas, which is the Spanish word for ghosts. During the day, each day, we would leave the boat on motorized, uh, uh, small motorized boats, enough to carry two groups, uh, one for photography and one for birding. And we went up these creeks that fed the major rivers that we were on to, to, to do photography. Sometimes the creeks were clogged with vegetation, but the boats went right through them. And why am I not advancing here? Ah, there we go. And at one point on the veg, walking on the vegetation was this caiman, caiman lizard, a very large lizard. The indigenous people in Amazonia live on these creeks in intricately thatched roofs, roofed homes open to the air to keep cool and raised on stilts against the rainy season. Um, they seem to be a very proud people to me. And uh, the travel, of course, was on the water. Some had motorized boats and some had dugout canoes. We spent some time with a lady on the left. She was a shaman, it took her three years of study alone with another shaman in the wilderness to become a shaman. She was a shaman to 10,000 people in multiple villages in Amazonia and medical doctors would refer patients to her when they knew she had a better cure than they did for, uh, for their ailments. She treated everything from stress to constipation and any other ailment you might have. The young lady on the right was the chief of the village where we distributed our uh, pens and pencils and pads and sporting goods. Uh, she was the chief of a fairly good sized village and uh, she did not speak any language anybody understood. She spoke a dialect that even our Peruvian guide did not understand. But she gave us a very animated discussion about her village and you could tell how proud she was just from her uh, emotions. On to birds, an Amazon kingfisher. I've had many kingfisher species. I love kingfishers and have seen many of them on my trips, um, be it uh, um, in uh, this hemisphere or the other. A very striking capped heron, fairly common bird along these creeks, the black collared hawk. Greater Annie in the cuckoo family, there are three species of any, I think I've seen two of them. Tropical screech owls are about the size of our Eastern screech owl. Slightly smaller, the ferruginous pygmy owl, widespread in Amazonia, but I've also seen them in Costa Rica. Blue-winged parrotlet, parrotlet. Oriole blackbird, very striking bird. We had nine species of primates in Amazonia. This is the black spider monkey and is, uh, does have a prehensile tail. So it does use that to support itself. Yellow rumped, yellow rumped cacique and new world blackbird family. And certainly the most striking bird that we saw on our trip, uh, sometimes called the reptile bird, the Hoatzin, H-O-A-T-Z-I-N, pheasant size. Uh, the only bird I know that I've seen, and perhaps more research would change this, but uh, the only bird I know that I've seen that it has that it's in its own family and order, the only bird in that family and order. Very striking bird. Fortunately, I was working at that time with a zoom lens and had to back off. We were so close to these birds. Our guides were great always at finding things for us to photograph. And we were on a uh, rainforest walk, arguably the, uh, the hottest place I've ever been. Um, and they found this monkey frog for us to photograph. And we did a little bit early in the, uh, I think on our way to the boat, we stopped and did some birding and some bird photography and some macro photography. Always interesting to me when I'm in foreign countries with certain expectations is to find a variety of habitat that you didn't expect. 
for example, to find snow-covered mountains in Morocco. And here in Peru, where you think about tropical vegetation, mostly, uh, there's a very large area around the coastal Peru of arid, almost desert-like habitat. And I was there, we were there twice during this, during this trip. The variable hawk that you see in this picture was uh, fairly common in this habitat. Here you can obviously see the habitat, very dry, very arid. And here's the burrowing owl again. Quite wide distribution of this, the first ones I ever saw were on the uh, University of California, Santa Cruz campus many, many years ago. Um, and the various subspecies usually are within certain areas within this wide distribution. Peruvian thick knees, ear doves, and the Andean tinamou. There are 46 species of tinamous in Mexico, and South America, and Central America. Some, like the one that we had on that first birding trip to Costa Rica, are very secretive. This one was very cooperative, but our guides had to find it. You can see it was pretty well camouflaged. We also went, you can see that habitat, that very dry, arid habitat, just uh, not expected. Um, we went to a uh, fishing village. It was also a kind of a beach village, a place to go uh, for some weekend uh, beach time. And uh, so there were people selling uh, uh, typical things you would find in the Jersey Shore for kids from the beach. Uh, we went out on boats to look at birds on the cliff sites along the Pacific Ocean here, and a really a rollicking ride on these boats, very difficult to photograph when the boat is being tossed around. But I did get photographs of a blackish oyster catcher. So, you know, this bird looks like the black oyster catcher of coastal California, but at least as of my search, the Latin names are different between the blackish and the black. The blackish is Ater, A-T-E-R, and the black is Bachmani. Did get my first blue-footed booby on this trip. You can see the spray there in the background coming off of the ocean. It was really uh, very rough there. We were, uh, the guides or the, the boat drivers had to keep the boats off the rocks. Humboldt penguins on the left and all of coastal Peru and parts of Chile have Humboldt penguins. They were my first penguins and you can see the guano encrusted rocks behind them and in the photo on the right of guane cormorants. Um, another new species of cormorant for me. And not a great photo, but a very striking bird, Inca terns. For the second part of the trip, uh, run in this time, the guide for this was Edison Buenaño, who arguably was the best birding guide I've ever been with. And on many of my, on all my trips, and uh, I've been with many very good guides. We flew from Lima to Cusco. And Cusco was the Inca capital, the former Inca capital. And it's at a little over 11,000 feet, which means altitude sickness can be a real problem here. And obviously you take it easy, everybody knows that. But what a lot of people don't know is you have to be remain very well hydrated at altitude, which is why when you look at movies of people climbing the uh, Mount Everest, you see them boiling water. Um, and dehydration is, is, is the first cause of altitude sickness. And if you're offered there in Cusco um, um, cocoa tea, which is slightly narcotic, it's very good against altitude sickness, I know. Um, on the right is another shot from Machu Picchu, and that's at about 8,000 feet, so it's not a problem there, which is really good because you do a lot of walking at Machu Picchu. One of the birds we had on Edison's part of the trip, the second trip I was on in, uh, when I was in uh, Peru, one of the birds we got, and this was again at private property, was a giant, what's called the giant hummingbird, the largest hummingbird in the world, 9.1 inches long. Keep in mind that the Northern Cardinal bird we're all familiar with is 8.75. So this bird is bigger than a Northern Cardinal, or at least longer anyway. Uh, so you've seen in this program, the smallest 
bird and the smallest hummingbird in the world and the largest. Not a great photo, but certainly one worth documenting. The sword-billed hummingbird had them uh, in Costa Rica and here in Peru. Obviously through evolution, designed to get into flowers that other hummingbirds cannot uh, help pollinate. The rufous collared sparrow, um, a very common bird. The first ones I saw was on a 2011 trip in Costa Rica, very common bird in Central and South America. And a very striking yellow-billed pintail, which we had in the wetlands that we visited. Then we went to Aguas Calientes, which is the jumping off point for all tourists going to Machu Picchu. It's accessible by two means, foot on the Inca Trail, a very rough hike that would take minimally three days, uh, or by train, obviously we took the train. Once you're there, you're part of the tourism industry there, and that's the only industry in Aguas Calientes because everything is based on hotels, restaurants, gift shops, uh, it's the only place I think I've ever be been that was 100% tourist oriented. You went to Machu Picchu by bus. The buses ran most of the day. Uh, the fleet of buses would, uh, I think, dwarf what's at uh, uh, the DeCamp line in New York City at, uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, Port Authority. Uh, buses ran all day there. We did do some birding along the Vilcanota River. And we got the red and white spine tail on that hike. And uh, one target species there in same in Central America and down into South America, uh, the torrent duck. This is a male and female. And despite the four or five rated rapids, these birds dove right in. On to more familiar territory or some of the photography work that I've done. Uh, Cape May and Barnegat Light. This uh, title slide, our title photo was taken at Cape May Point right off of St. Mary's in the winter when I do most of my birding in this area. And it was an HDR shot, meaning a combination of two exposures to expose the foreground and the background correctly. Northern Pintail, one of my favorite ducks. Uh, off of Higby's Beach a uh, surf scoter, and this was taken with a tripod at, at uh, equivalent 1200 millimeters. At one 5,000th speed, one 5,000th of a second, black scoters off of uh, Cape Bay. Potaparts gull, winter plumage sanderling. And I couldn't resist taking a picture of the Cardinal at the Cape May Bird Observatory feeders and the picture of the uh, blackback gull on the uh, scope at Barnegat Light. My favorite shorebird is the purple sandpiper seen on the left in here with two or three uh, bready turnstones. Long-tailed ducks with a following wind. And my tribute to Bar uh, Bobby Darren, a bathing harlequin duck. Forsyth, I've spent a lot of time at Forsyth in the last couple of years doing photography, black crowned night heron, and a great egret and great blue heron, snowy egret, and a regurgitating juvenile yellow crowned night heron. And I missed the shot of what he was regurgitating, unfortunately. Eastern kingbird, and I like taking pictures, uh, the challenge of taking pictures to bring blackbirds because they tend to be very skittish, far more skittish than other birds. Yellow rump warbler. And on to Bombay hook, and another red winged blackbird photo. And one of my favorite photos, though it's not in really sharp focus, the winter plumage avocet and, uh, and reflected in the pool as well as the, uh, the fall plumage, the uh, fall uh, um, foliage reflected in the water. And another red winged blackbird, double crested cormorant that I actually took uh, near their mosquito control area at Bombay, hook up that little road that's usually blocked off there 
where you don't want to meet another vehicle. And another double crested Pomeran shot. Common grackle. Cedar waxwing. Goldfinch, of course. And a very young black vulture taken at the Ali house before they put up the signs saying, stay out. And I'll take photos of other things that I see, such as these zero cumulus clouds. Hines, I've spent quite a bit of time at Hines, marsh wren, and only part of the brood of this uh, female wood duck. The others were trailing behind. And I got very lucky with this shot of the least bitter. Mostly you see photos of this bird uh, trying to hide in the reeds, but I caught it uh, on low tide on Darby Creek, uh, uh, strutting along the marsh of uh, the mud flat there, and was able to slide down the bank and, and get this uh, um, not often achieved photo. Barn swallow, house wren that was actually nesting, house wren. I do other photography as well, I have other photography interests, uh, including architectural, landscape, and macro. And the photo on the left was taken at a one-day photo workshop with Joe Reardon Photography at Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia, a historic site in Philadelphia. This was taken at the entrance to Hopo Furnace National Historic Site next to French Creek State Park. And this was taken in a building in French Creek, in Hopo Furnace, and it's been accepted into a juried exhibition in Plymouth, Massachusetts, which starts on May 1. I'm sending it up there tomorrow. I also do photography at Longwood. Both of these were from Longwood. And of course, as Barry mentioned, the Adirondacks. I was on a photo workshop there in 2019. And um, um, this is the Big Dipper over top of the Aurora Borealis on the horizon there. Adirondack Fall Reflections, one of my favorite photographs missed on Rocket Lake. And the last photo in the series, uh, the Milky Way with Jupiter rising. I do have a website, williambarber.smugmug.com. Nothing for sale, it's just a good place to preserve and show photographs. Though I do donate framed photos to charity and nonprofit auctions and they sell very well. So I thank you for your attention. And I will accept any questions anybody has at this time. That was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Really nice pictures. Amazing, amazing nice. photos. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Gorgeous. Thank you. So I've enjoyed that. So so, you know, I haven't been around the club very much in the last 10 years, and it's mostly because of photography. And if you want to blame somebody, don't blame me, blame John McNamara for getting me really interested in uh, this terrific uh, hobby, which does dovetail nicely with birding, as, as you obviously can see. So I have really spent my time learning photography, learning the equipment, and uh, it's uh, not, an easy not an easy hobby to learn and do well. It takes just as much patience as birding does, if not more. Mm -hmm. uh, you're shooting with an Olympus now. How do you like that? I love it. Um, I can, it's got great image stabilization, about 7.5 to 8 stops of image stabilization. And I can hand hold 